Uh, what am I saying? This is MPW, 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 MPW the podcast with your host, Zylo Aria. Cool. A podcast about music production for the everyday musician, where we learn from experienced studio engineers and each other. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the MPW podcast. I'm your host, Zylo Aria, and today we are here with the lovely Talia Rose. So Talia is a mastering engineer and is the latest team member in the mastering team of the incredible Studio 301, uh, pretty much the largest studio in Australia, and has worked with artists such as Electric Fields, Lip Gloss, Warwick Kennedy, The Strangers, and loads more. So such a pleasure to have with us this morning. Talia, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. It's a wonderful morning here in Sydney. We finally have sunshine after weeks of rain, so I'm doing well. Oh, <laughs> that is lovely. Uh, very good to hear. So um, today we are chatting about how you know when your song is finished and and kind of getting it to that stage and what advice you might have um, for musicians to do that. But before we get to that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and where things started in music for you and how you got to where you are today. Well, music has always been a big part of my life. Since I was a toddler, I was bashing on pots and pans and got into drumming at a young age. So throughout high school, I was in a couple of different bands and playing all sorts of genres of music. And it was just amazing. Um, and from there, I went to university and did a Bachelor of Audio Engineering because I got really interested in how can I capture my own sound, which was uh, a fun couple of years there. And immediately after that, I got an internship offer at Studios 301. I stayed there for a year doing a studio internship and then I moved on to a mastering internship. And yeah, just from there I kind of slowly worked my way through the studios as an assistant and bringing in my own sessions and eventually last year got on the page as a mastering engineer. That is super exciting and uh, yeah, just uh, seeing the page, it was very exciting for me to find you there and yeah, just hearing your drive and your work ethic and stuff as well when we had a chat was so, so great to hear. So yeah, it's great to chat uh, with you and get some of your wisdom uh, today on the podcast. So getting into our topic, why would you say that a mastering engineer or mastering engineers in general might be good people in the creation process to determine, you know, the quality of a, a song. Well, as mastering engineers, our entire career is creating a finished product that needs to go out to consumers. So every day that we're in the studio, we are listening to tracks and determining what is best suited to make it stand out amongst the thousands of tracks that come out every day. And also what formats they need to be for whatever platforms or devices that artists choose, whether that's vinyl or CD or just streaming itself. So we're always thinking ahead towards the, the end product and we listen to hundreds of finished songs and make different decisions on whether it needs a lot of work to get it to that stage or whether we just need to turn it up and add a bit of sparkle and shine. So we're not at the, the beginning stage of the whole process, but we're at the end. And so we just have a, I think, a good understanding of a completed song and how to turn a track into a song as well. And yeah, it's just, it's good because it also helps me as an engineer when I do go back in the process, I go back to recording or mixing in my head, I've already thought about the end product and how it's going to sound at that stage. So that's why I think um, it's really great being a mastering engineer, getting to hear that finished work 
and turning that into a song that consumers can listen to. Okay, okay. It was really interesting that you said turning a track into a song and I think we will grow into that a little bit more as we go along. But yeah, I think so many people seem to struggle with they've got a song or a track to a certain stage and then they just feel stuck on how to actually get it to that finished, polished stage. So we'll dig into that a little bit more. And one thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit as well as a mastering engineer, I remember you mentioned your mentor, Steve Smart, had given you an assignment to listen to, you know, loads of music. So can you tell me a little bit about like, what was that assignment and what were you trying to get out of listening to, you know, loads of music? Yeah, that was um, a very long assignment. There wasn't really an end date to it. He basically (laughs) said, you know, as a mastering engineer, you're going to be in this room for a long time and you need to understand the space and the speakers like the back of your hand. It needs to become a part of you. So he gave me the task of going in as often as I could and listening to every genre under the sun and just really pulling them apart in the studio, listening to all the different little parts of the song, all the instruments, how they all fit together, how, you know, all different songs sounded when they were finished because different genres, of course, are mastered differently to suit the needs. So I probably spent about a year before I said I was ready sitting in the studio listening to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tracks, ones that I knew really well, ones that I didn't know at all. And I just got really familiar with the sound of a finished song. Because before that, you listen to music and you're more getting in touch with the emotions and the journey of the song. As a consumer, that's what you're normally listening for. So I had to come at a different approach Obviously, emotion is a very big part of it because what makes a song great is if it touches your soul. But I came into it listening technically to how a track was glued together, how it jumped out of the speakers and felt like it was right there in your face, like you were at a concert. Mm. All the different techniques that uh, different engineers across the planet were using to get that sound So it was a a really great exercise and I don't think I would be where I am today if I hadn't spent a year just listening to other people's work in that critical environment. Wow. A year assignment of just listening to music. That is huge. And this really sounds like active listening to the next level. So how would you go about that? Would you take a bunch of notes or would you just take it in? And did you get to a point where you could just pick things apart in in your head? And how did that go? Yeah, so there were some times where I'd take a couple of different notes or I would just listen critically and maybe try and emulate that sound on a track that I was doing. So, of course, you know, in music, it's always great to reference tracks. And I still do it today all the time. You know, if someone sends through a a drum and bass track, I'm like, okay, I need to go and hear what's out there so I can make sure that it's at, you know, the same standard as all the other great tracks out there. I also did spend a lot of time listening to Steve's masters and I would try and copy that. So I'd get the track, the unmastered track and practice. And then I'd compare and see how I went compared to his master. And nine times out of 10, I was like, I, how did he do that? (laughs) (laughs) I'm just blown away. And then I'd go and find his notes and and see what settings he did differently to me. And then next time I'd go back to my own master, I would try something of his or I'd listen to a song and go, oh, I really like how they achieved that top end on that track. It's really crispy, but it's not sharp. Let's play around and see if I can achieve that that same tone. So there were lots of different different little things that really depended on the day and, and what I was up to. 
but a lot of it was just listening and copying and or listening and trying to do something similar but maybe with my own flair. Okay, that's great. I'm sure there was so much so much learning uh, throughout that whole process. Talking a little bit more about the sort of track to a song process and and the struggle that musicians seem to have with getting their song to a more finished state and then might just give up at a certain stage and just call it done. And I think there is a saying that art is never complete, it's just abandoned or something like that. But I guess for some people they do get to a point where they're like, this is the thing, you know, this is the finished song. And I guess some projects might come to you where you think, oh, you know, maybe it's not really there yet and there's something that could have been done to to make it that full uh, finished song. What would you say in this scenario might make it seem that way and might make it seem a bit unfinished and what can people listen out for to think that, okay, maybe it's not 100% there yet? There's... Well, with art, obviously, it's always, you know, subjective. So it's hard to say, oh, that's a terrible mix. That's why it's not finished. Or that's a great mix. That's why it's not finished. Because sometimes people choose to mix or record things in a particular way. And to them, that sounds great. Mm. But to me, when I listen to songs and I feel like that might not be 100% finished or, you know, they might have just sent it through because they feel like they can't do anything more. It comes back to the emotions of the song and the journey. Mm. It's very easy to send through a song that still feels like it's individual tracks. So it's still, to me, I can feel like, I feel like there is drums and there's bass and there's vocals and they're all separate parts trying to work together Mm. and then some tracks will come to me and it's incredibly cohesive and you just go okay great this is all working together this is you know this is all kind of melded it's a it's a final piece it's it's working on this journey from start to finish nothing's really sticking out as though it doesn't fit And you can achieve that in mixing. You can achieve that all the way back to songwriting and production. There's a lot of tracks out there which sound great because the people who have worked on it have gotten it to a stage where everything just flows together. It's all supposed to be there. And whether that's in Mm -hmm. balancing, that's just changing the sound of a kick that might just be adding more reverb to the vocals so it blends a little better. There's all slight different things that people can do. But then there's also tracks that I've received where everything still feels quite separate. The The drums are just sticking out way too much or they, they just don't feel like they're attached to the song. So you might have, mm, mm. you know, vocals and guitar and bass all sounds really great and co- cohesive. And then the drums are off on their own planet. You're like, oh, okay. I mean, it, <laughs> yes. you know, it sounds great for sure, but it doesn't sound like all the parts are working together. Something's not translating properly. And then I'll either go back to the artist and have a chat with them and say, hey, I don't think this feels like it's completely finished yet. Could you maybe have a look at changing the level of the drums or adding less compression here or bringing something in to work with it and sometimes you know go back and they'll do that and then it sounds really great and I'm like yes this is awesome yeah. let's go <laughs> sometimes they think it sounds great and they're like oh actually you know I'm really happy with that I don't think we need to change it and I'm like that's completely fine like this is your track it was just my opinion and then I'll work from there and it sounds great either way but I think mm. it's just getting all those components together to work together to sound like they're supposed to be one final product as opposed to five separate things all just playing at the same time. Mm-hmm. That's that's really great that I guess you 
take that critical uh, listening time to really think what's working and what's not and then going back to the artist to make those final changes. And, yeah, and I guess sometimes that's taken one way and sometimes maybe not. But then kind of coming back to your experience in, in listening to so much, so much music in this beautiful kind of space, did you find any sort of ingredients that you feel make a great song from a songwriting or a production perspective? Yeah, for sure. I think something that's so important in music is the storytelling. And it doesn't necessarily need to be through lyrics. You don't need to actually tell me a once upon a time story. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. That could even be done through the melodies or the structure of the song or how... Mm you finish a verse or what chords you use. It's all about painting a picture and, you know, what colours are you putting together, I guess, what tones are working together. There's a lot of songs out there that the structure might just be verse one, verse two, verse three, chorus, done. That's not your (laughs) typical song structure, right? But the way that they have played on each verse, the way it's built, the way the journey goes from start to finish is what makes it a great song. And it, mm. when I'm listening to it, if it moves me and if I get really excited by it, then I go, okay, this is, this is awesome. This has worked out really well. It might not be conventional, but it's there. I mean, of course, you know, a classic song structure of, you know, intro, verse, pre-chorus, chorus is absolutely fine and that works every time for sure. But there's a bit of a deeper aspect to it that I think makes a good song and it's all the subtle movements and the small things that really piece everything together. Because I'm, I would say I'm a baby producer, <laughs> as in I have just... <laughs> recently started out and when you're at that you know starting stage in songwriting you can have some great lyrics and you can have three or four chords that sound awesome and you can put them all together but it's not it doesn't sound like a final piece because I haven't worked on the actual emotional journey of the song there's Mm. just two components they sound great but where is the movement what are they doing? How do, what does it represent in the piece as well? Maybe that's getting really deep and some people might just go, I chose, you know, C major because why not? Was, that's where my hands are on the keyboard and it worked just fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is there specific things, I guess, if we're looking at melodic um, elements of a, a, of a song, do you feel like there's some sort of, journey or like recipe that's worked really well like you know for example having less consistency through all the sections or um, having a change in dynamic or something that you think really adds to a song yeah dynamics such a great way to create movement and change within a song so having some, you know, a quiet, more stripped back verse coming into such a massive, powerful chorus is such a great way to move and progress in a song. And it's a great way to add change and a bit of diversity to your track. Even if it's the same chords, you don't have a lot of change in the melody. That's a beautiful Mm. way to move a piece along, whether through just adding more layers in a chorus or even just making it louder in the chorus. Sometimes we even do that in mastering where we'll actually change the sections so that a chorus hits better and a verse is a little bit more laid back. And melody as well, it's getting a little bit technical, but working with cadences, having a, a perfect cadence at the end of a phrase, or if you want to shake things up, you go into an imperfect cadence, which doesn't feel resolved, but you're like, just wait for it. It's going to get resolved in the chorus. <laughs> like, There's a lot of technical things that you can kind of delve into that would change a song and, and take it to a new level that maybe not all producers or songwriters necessarily know. And it's a great mm. way to 
kind of play around and see where you can take it. So whether that's um, resolving a verse and, and then coming into the chorus or leaving the verse on a cliffhanger and everyone's waiting and then you might have a bit of silence and then bam, you come in with the chorus and it, it resolves itself and you're like, wow. And whether you necessarily know the technical you know, aspects of yeah. that as a consumer, that's how the emotions kind of flow. Like watching a movie, mm. you really kind of plan out where you're going to take the listener. You could go on forever about how many different things you could add to to create such a, a great piece of work, but it really comes down to, you know, if you were the listener, how would you be hearing it? And sometimes taking yourself out of the songwriter or the producer chair and coming back to your piece as a listener, which can be quite difficult, especially if you've listened to your own track a hundred million times. But yeah. being able <laughs> <laughs> being able to step out of yourself for a moment and try and listen with a new perspective and see, is this moving me? Is this what I am trying to achieve in the song? Or even sending it to your mum, that's a great one. I send all my tracks to my mum sometimes if I've lost perspective. Yeah. And having someone else just have a quick listen and see if it's achieving what you want it to as well is a, a really great technique. Mm. Okay, yeah, definitely uh, helpful, I guess, to have uh, a fresh pair of ears uh, listen to them, but also important on who that is as well and someone that you trust. So um, that's that's great. And uh, another thing that you mentioned around when you now make music, you kind of do that with the end in sight. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how can someone put that into practice to make sure that they actually reach that rather than, you know, end up somewhere sort of 75% through? When I think about music that I'm creating and the final product, a lot of what I'm thinking about is how will it translate next to other songs? So if I'm making a pop song and I want it to sound great and I want it to sound finished. How does that sound if I immediately played a Justin Bieber track after it or a Dua Lipa track? Mm. I keep myself, I guess, in check by going back and just listening to finished songs and how they sit and how they feel and then going back to my own work and going, okay, great, like the structure is there, all the pieces are sounding really good. But I've just missed that little bit of compression or that, that bit of reverb that's actually just gluing that a bit together more. Or oh, I've really buried those vocals. All these other pop songs, the vocals are really loud and super bright. And I'd love to get that same tone to my track. I think that's a great way to think about where the finished product is going to end up is kind of, is listening to your peers as well, you know. You don't have to listen to the top 50 playlist, but just listening to tracks that have come out that are a similar sound to yours is always a good reference. Because yeah. if you don't reference and you just continue working in your own little bubble, you can lose perspective really quickly. Yeah, And you yeah. think maybe it's finished or... You think it's sounding really great, which it might sound really great and it's perfect, send it off, go ahead. Or you might mm. be in that bubble for so long you just don't know if it sounds good anymore. And I think we've all been at yeah. that place <laughs> before. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Even I have. And, you know, sometimes it's great just to take a couple of days break, work on something else, mm. you know, start some new ideas that you've had sitting in the books for a while and go to those with and get some new fresh perspective and inspiration as well and then you can go back yeah. to your finished piece and go wow that's amazing like look at that that's so <laughs> cool or you might come back and go okay yeah it's sounding really good but now I can finally hear what I was missing and it's I needed a different tone on the keys or I wanted to do more compression on the vocals to make them pop 
So yeah, yeah. referencing is such a, a great way to make sure that you're heading towards that final product, especially mm. if you're not a mastering engineer, because a lot of people aren't. Mm. And understanding how we technically create a track to be yeah. put out to the public is a bit of a, a fine art, I guess. And some people say it's pretty difficult to understand. <laughs> so if you're a songwriter or a producer, I think just having those references or creating a really strong playlist for yourself of songs that you mm. love, songs that really move you, songs that are similar to what you're creating or things that have inspired you, having that playlist and going back to it all the time is a really good way. I actually have a playlist that I created maybe two or three years ago, like my mastering playlist of songs that I really loved that I thought sounded okay. great. I still go back and reference that all the time. That's great. Okay, so references, super important. And uh, just to know what inspires you and have that as something, you know, to aim for somewhere around there so that you know where you're trying to go at the start. Okay, that's, uh, that's great advice. And do you happen to have any pet peeves on uh, certain things or issues in music that you see a lot when projects come to you? And do you have any advice for people before they send off to a mastering engineer? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> people need to stop mixing in headphones. I understand that sometimes there are limitations to your setup, but I get a lot of tracks that, you know, have been mixed, I guess, on just little headphones or, or AirPods or something. And I bring it into a, this massive studio with these huge speakers and it sounds super tinny and the bass is all over the place and things are not balanced correctly. And I'll have to go through and do a lot of work to make it sound good. And it's one of those things of if you want to achieve a great sound, you really should be referencing in so many different environments, on headphones, in the car, on one of those yucky Bluetooth speakers. Although sometimes there's good quality ones, but yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of bad ones out there too. Yeah, just referencing on as many different um, speaker systems that you can so that you're making sure it translates well. That's probably uh, my main pet peeve is I listen to something and I think, did you check this before you sent it? <laughs> That's, yeah, it happens more often than you'd think. Yeah, people just need to really just go back and, and make sure that they have signed off on it in every possible listening environment that they have before they send it through. Because without that, you might bring it into the car or somewhere else and it just sounds completely different. It doesn't sound like the song that you thought it was. So that's a big one. Another pet peeve I have is, and this is more in the mixing stage, is when mm. people leave lots of edit mistakes in there. And I do have incredibly sensitive ears as a mastering engineer. So, mm. <laughs> I, you know, I give everyone the benefit of the doubt that they might not have heard it in the song or they've listened to a song so many times that they've glossed over it. But there's a lot of tracks that have come through that have glitches or pops or little mistakes okay. or noises as well that just once I turn it up really loud, it sticks out like a sore thumb. If it was in a playlist, you know, on Spotify or something, it's it will be there and everyone mm. will hear it. So it's just yeah. all those like what I'd call like general tidying kind of things that sometimes get missed in tracks because everyone's getting really into the moment. They're like, this sounds great. And then they've just left a few, a few bits and pieces in there that weren't necessarily supposed to be there, but they've gotten excited and moved on and forgotten that that's there. It's kind of blended into the song a bit. And then I come yeah. in with fresh yeah. ears and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> what happened here? <laughs> 
That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, okay. Okay, good things to think about there. So don't mix just on headphones and have lots of different reference places for your mix and try to have a, a fresh listen so that any major mistakes are hopefully out before we get to the mastering stage. Okay, thank you for that. And um, I guess going a little bit back to your career and where you've gotten so far and, you know, it's so exciting to see, what, you know, what lies ahead as well and where you're going to go. But what would you say has been the biggest highlight in your career so far? I think my biggest highlight was when Steve took me under his wing, really. I was pretty young. I wasn't 100% sure what I was doing in this industry yet. I was just bumbling about creating pretty bad mixes, which I can't listen to yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just giving it my all at Studios 301, doing the best that I could. And Steve Smart and Lindley Whitesmith, who was the previous mastering manager, they, yeah, they really just gave me a chance and said, hey, is this an opportunity that you'd want to look into? Do you want to be a mastering engineer? And I thought, mm. heck yes. <laughs> this is such a, <laughs> such a dark art. Who Like the mastering rooms are at the back of the studio. You never see the engineers. All this great work comes <laughs> out of there and you have no idea what's going on. So, yeah, I said yes. I um, spent a lot of time with Steve. He taught me so many things and, like, my career would not be what it is without the both of them and the fact that they saw something in me and said, you know, let's let's develop this, let's give her a chance. So that's my my biggest highlight is just being able to work with Steve and share his knowledge and just be a part of this environment. I mean, when I was at uni, <laughs> I used to Google Steve <laughs> and look okay. at his profile on the website and, you know, like read up about him and what he was up to. And yeah, when I was 19, 18, 19, I was like, one day, one day I'll be like that. So when he came around with, and said, you know, would you like to jump on board? It was a pretty big moment. And I'm not sure if I told wow. him that, but. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we'll have to send him this episode. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. But that's, yeah, that's, that's my highlight. And that the people that I, that were my heroes are now my friends and now my mentor as well. Like, it's just crazy. Wow. That's so beautiful. And I feel like there's been some sort of manifestation thing in here, you know, like you've been, uh, you know, looking at these people that you admire for so long and, and aspiring to that. And, uh, and it's somehow happened that you, you kind of connected those dots, which is incredible. And, and I think none of these things happen by accident and, uh, and, it's about having that in the in the back of your mind as a goal. So, so I love that. Absolutely. That's great. And then talking about the flip side, the greatest challenge uh, so far, what do you think that has been? And, you know, have you overcome it? And if so, how did you do that? I think, you know, obviously being a female in the music industry has always been a bit of a challenge trying to stand my ground in the industry and make myself heard, especially as a young female in the industry. We don't necessarily have those skills on how to be assertive and how to speak up for yourself. And it's taken quite a number of years to get to that stage. And I've had a lot of you know, bad or uncomfortable moments in my career, but it's definitely made me resilient and I've come out the other side really understanding who I am as an engineer and confident in my skill set 
and confident that I am in the place and the position that I deserve to be in as well. So it took a while, but I think I am in a good place and I hope that other female engineers or non-binary engineers in the industry don't have to go through as much stuff that I did in order to get to a place of confidence and understanding of their own craft. But yeah, I would say that's probably been the biggest challenge is making myself, presenting myself in a way that I know that I am uh, confident in my abilities and mm. and that I'm in the space that I'm supposed to be in because there's a lot of people out there who will tell you that you shouldn't be where you are in your career or why are people mm. working with you and so on and mm. so forth. But having that conviction in yourself and that resilience that I've built over time has gotten me to a stage where people, you know, I can't be bullied out of my studio or out of my space and every day I go to work I love what I do and I love who I am and it's been really good the the challenges were a good lesson I think because I was quite a mm. timid person when I came into the industry and mm. I didn't stand up for myself and that's yeah. been a little bit of a process and I still every day have to remind myself of that and come into the workplace with a confidence in myself because mm. once you give off that confidence or you know who you are, people mm. step back and they stop, they stop trying to bring you down because they realise that you're, yeah. you're untouchable and not in some egotistical kind of way but in that mm. you know who you are and no one can bring you down or make you feel bad mm. about your work or your position in your you know in the workplace I love that uh, there's yeah so much there that I think a lot of uh, our listeners can probably relate to and maybe they're not there yet where they've found that confidence and it's still is very easy to feel put down by all of the external factors that, that unfortunately just happen. <laughs> but what advice would you have for anyone that's aspiring to also be, you know, a, an engineer in this space that's maybe not found that confidence yet? I would say that a great thing to do is start practising resilience because there's always going to be issues down the track. I still face issues, you know, every other week or so and I have to remind myself of that resilience that I've built up and keep myself in check as well and also mm -hmm. take time for self-care. This industry is tough. We're not regulated, so we work long hours. Um, we tend to overwork ourselves. We're in the the hustle culture where you need to be posting online all the time. You need to prove to people that you are working hard and being successful every single day. And it's it can be tiring and it can burn people out. So remembering to have that self-care, practicing resilience as well so that it doesn't affect you every day that mm. you come into work two big things but then also on the technical side it's just never stop learning always ask questions and don't be shy about it because mm. everyone out there is you know well, everyone that I've met has been super keen to share their knowledge and bring you into the fold and show you what we're doing and it's just such a great way to build your career establish connections in the industry and just become a better engineer. Like you'll never stop learning. I've spoken to Steve and he's still learning every day and he's been in this career for a very long time. And I would say, yeah, yesterday I was in the studio and I was still learning about a piece of equipment and trying out new things and surprising myself. And, you know, <laughs> I never stop and go, well, clearly you're not a good engineer because you didn't know that. 
it's like, no, this is, this is really exciting. Like I just learned a new thing. <laughs> I can, I can use that going forward and that's awesome. It's just, I love that. yeah, it's just really looking after yourself and mm. remembering as well why you got into this in the first place. Like I mm. love music. I just absolutely adore it and I could listen forever and just continue to be excited and passionate and I don't want to lose that because I've turned that into my career, into my job. Mm -hmm, for sure. So much, so much good advice there. Thank you, Talia. And um, uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people can get get a lot from that around building resilience and, and also the learning as well. Uh, such an important part of um, this industry, but in general, really. So that's excellent. Thank you for sharing that with us. And before I let you go um, into the sunshine of Sydney, uh, we actually had quite a few audience questions come in for you, but you've actually done a great job of answering quite a few of them during our podcast. But there is one um, that I think we haven't gotten to, and uh, it might be an something that's relevant, especially coming into uh, new technologies and AI and everything. So there's a question from New Concerns and uh, they asked, why use a mastering engineer versus software or website mastering? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love that question. Uh, Look, you can use a website or an AI mastering engineer if you want. However, they're not mastering from a, an emotional connected state. They're mastering from an algorithm. You put in your track, the system goes, this is a pop song. All right, I have to turn it up to this level, boost this, you know, compress that and spit it out within five minutes. And it doesn't matter what the song is or how you've mixed it. The algorithm just goes, okay, this is what I've got. This is what I'm going to spit out. It doesn't necessarily always adjust to the song itself. It's not mm. listening to the movement of the song. Maybe your, mm. your track needs to have different compression in the verses and the choruses. Maybe it doesn't actually need any top end. Maybe... You know, there's so many different things that you could possibly do with every single track. And mm. we make choices based off how it moves us. Sometimes we need to do corrective decisions as well, but mainly I make decisions in mastering based off how it makes me feel and what I want to hear so that I feel excited and I feel I love this song. And AI is not going to do that. It's just, uh, you know, zeros and ones and coding and all that scary stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it works towards, okay, we need to make it a certain loudness for Spotify, for Apple Music. Let's go. Mm. Which, again, if that's all you can afford, that's completely fine. You know, it, who's to say whether a master is bad or good? Someone might listen to mine and think, that's awful. Why did she do that? <laughs> Someone might listen to an AI master and go, oh, that's, that's really great sounding. But if you want some, like if you want the human aspect, you need to go to a human mastering engineer. Your song was written by a human. You put in the personification of, you know, what's in your head into this piece. You've, mm -hmm. This is your heart and your soul. This is like your baby and you've developed it and you've spent so much energy on this. And then you've done the same with mixing. You've got another human involved or maybe you've done it yourself and you've tweaked it and you've spent hours just fine tuning this thing just to send it to an AI at the end. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> why, why would you lose that human aspect at the last stage, what, which personally, and this is just because I'm biased, is the most important stage <laughs> of the entire yeah. process and the stage that we are, are finishing this so that consumers listen and are moved by it. Mm. Are you going to lose some yes. of that emotion? That's the question. And mm -hmm. that's where I think, you know, you need to make your decision on 
who or what you're going to do for mastering. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I was personally very convinced by that answer. So uh, thank you. Um, you know, why Why new concerns? Why would we lose that human touch? But <laughs> that's, that's great. And I think it's, you know, it's an important thing to address as well as it, as it comes up more and more these days. But um, that's been so, so lovely. Thank you so much, Talia. And uh, it's been really useful, everything that you've said, not just around the, the song structures, but also talking a bit about your career and your experiences. And uh, I've gotten a lot of a lot from it personally as well. So um, thank you again. And uh, do you uh, do you have much planned for today? And are you going to get get outside or? Is it uh, work? <laughs> it's half and half. I'll probably go and mm. stand out in the sunshine. As most engineers know, we all have a vitamin D deficiency from being <laughs> in a closed room all the time. Um, I've yeah. got some production to do, which will be really nice. So I'm going nice. to get out Ableton and my little MIDI keyboard and have a play around. But Yeah, just a, a nice chill day, which I'm looking forward to. I can just... Let the creative ideas flow. Sounds lovely. All right. Well, I will let you get back to that. And thank you again. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye.